Why do people go bald? Why are baboons' bums red? What's a light year? Why do leaves go brown in the autumn? Why do monkeys like bananas? Why do some things glow in the dark? Why do animals not understand? Why do minus heat stay after a year? Don't know the answer? Ask the Naked Scientists. Hello and welcome to this week's Ask the Naked Scientists with me, Sue Marchant and Dave Ansell. Dr Dave, says Bob in Felixstowe, what is the difference between and causes of fog and mist? Fog and mist are basically the same thing. They're both little tiny droplets of water suspended in the air. There's nothing actually fundamentally different about how the two of them are made. It's just defined that mist is if the um, visibility is reduced to less than two kilometres and fog if it's less than one kilometre. So it's just a kind of matter of degree between the two of them. Mm. Both of them occur if you get sort of some warm, moist air and cool it down a few degrees below what's called the dew point. This is the point at which water starts falling out of the air and starts to condense on things. If you get enough below the dew point, it'll start condensing on little bits of dust in the air and forms little water droplets, which then scatter light, which means you can't see very far. You can cool um, warm air down for a few different ways. One reason you get in sort of valleys in the morning is that uh, over the night, the air, especially at the tops of the hills, loses lots of heat. And as it gets colder, it shrinks and that Mm. gets denser. It kind of flows down into the valleys. And then you still get some kind of quite warm ground in the valleys. So you'll get sort of um, water evaporating off all the plants Mm. and damp soils and stuff in the Mm. valleys. So you get some warm air meeting this cold air coming down. So that will cool it down and you'll form the droplets and you'll form a fog or a mist depending on how little distance you can see. In the winters you can also get fogs basically just if you get a warm lump of air meeting a cold lump of air on the ground Mm. you can form a cloud at ground level. Um, You also get kind of sea mists where at night the air cools down quite a lot but the sea is still very warm. As the cold air meets the warm air from the sea then that will condense the mm. water into droplets and you get a fog or a mist again. Of course, there was the great smogs, weren't there? The London smogs. So where does that differentiate between <laughs> our fog and mist? Um, that is basically a fog, but with a load of smoke in it. Yeah. So, um, and because there's lots and lots of smoke during the Industrial Revolution, everyone was burning coal, which has got lots of um, sort of sulphur compounds in it and other sort of bits of rock which don't burn up completely. So they come out of the chimney as we call smoke. Then if on a cold, damp day, then that joins in with the fog, you get something really, really opaque, mm. and especially because you've got lots and lots of little um, bits of dust and stuff for the water to condense on. So you can form really, really solid, thick fogs, what they call smogs. And as people cleaned up the cities and stopped burning coals in sit- the coal in cities, then basically you don't really get smogs anymore. Mm. You do sometimes get smogs called photochemical smogs. You get nitrogen dioxide released from cars, and that can produce a kind of horrible brown haze stuff, which you can see over places like LA in the mm. summer. Now then, Tony has said if you had ice made from fresh water um, that had been frozen for a long period of time, would it still be drinkable? I think fundamentally, yes, especially if you've been kept very cold so nothing could grow in it. If you're walking around on the Antarctic and you've, you don't carry your water with you, you just mm. dig up some ice mm. and put it in a um, thing, boil it up and drink it. And some of that ice, if you're in an area of the Antarctic where it doesn't hardly snows at all, some Mm. areas get less than a millimetre of snow a year, the water you're drinking could be thousands of years old. And similarly with stuff coming off icebergs, yes, there's no reason at all why you shouldn't drink frozen water. I think if it's been kind of only just below zero, Mm. then you can sometimes get some some bugs growing in it, Mm. which may be a problem. All right, thank you very much. More questions coming up in the shape of uh, anonymous text that came in. Um, The UK and the Russians have sent probes to other planets to explore and photo the surface, but what about rock samples? Did they bring any back? Because they brought some back from the moon. We haven't brought anything back from any of the other planets, basically because it's so far away. Um, If you think of the space rocket, you need to to get a probe up off the Earth and then to get to another planet you then have to send that size space rocket to the other planet in order to be able to get anything back again mm. so the space rocket you need to launch it on the, from the Earth would be absolutely immense and we just haven't done that yet mm. we've got stuff back from the moon um, we have got rock samples back from some comets recently they flew a um, space probe through the tail of a comet 
And because a comet doesn't have very much gravity, you don't have the problem of trying to get back out off it again. So you don't need to send nearly as big a space probe, you don't need as big a rocket to get back off it. Um, and so they sent this back and they managed to land this back on Earth. It was only a couple of years ago. And then they can have a look. They're only tiny, tiny particles. They can actually study these tiny particles and work out what the comet was made out of. Although they haven't sent any rock samples back, they have studied the rocks quite closely when mm. you're on the planets. So they've um, taken up things to look, look at it, all sorts of different colours of light. And from sure. that, you can work out what kind of minerals are on in the rocks. Yeah. Um, and they've done all sorts of other... You know, they, they actually took a microscope on the most recent Mars ro rover so they can drive around and look up very closely at the rocks mm. and work out what's going on. A little grinder so they could grind off the surface and have a look. <laughs> inside although we do have some samples of rock which we think have come from mars and possibly venus and some other planets not because we've gone out to get them but because they've landed on our doorstep wow because uh, if you've got great big um, meteorites hitting a planet, if you get a big enough one, some bits of the fragments which fly off actually fly right out of that planet and start flying around the solar system at random then with any luck they come and la land on earth and so if you look at enough meteorites, some of them probably came from another planet. And by looking at what they're made of, definitely some of them they've um, associated with Mars because mm. um, the, the kind of rocks are the ones you find on Mars. And that, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was a big story about people maybe have found, finding some little bacteria on one of these yes. meteorites from Mars. We're still not sure whether they were protobacteria or not. But those were the rocks. They were actually a meteorite slammed into Mars, blew off some little tiny bits, and these little tiny bits landed on Earth, and we can study those. Fascinating stuff. Ian is on the phones. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, Sue. How are you? Oh, very well. <laughs> Good. Yeah, when we had that hoar frost the other day, yeah. I had to travel about a oh, mile and a half up to a house in the state, mm -hmm. and there was about seven houses. One side the roof was completely white, the other side they had no frost on at all. Whether the one was side the roof was due east and one was due west, whether it made any difference. They might, I mean, they were dotted about in odd places, not all in one row. Sure. Okay. I've never experienced anything like it. Was it. Were they all facing the same direction? Yeah, they more or less, how I worked it out, one side the roof was east and one side was due west. Was this quite early in the morning? Yes, the, yes. But the sun had come out by then? No, no, the sun hadn't come out. But it was daytime? Yes. Even if the sun actually doesn't come out from behind a cloud, you'll get more heat coming from the east in the morning than you will do from the west. Yeah. So what yeah, I... but it seemed the west side of the house, the roof wasn't white. It was the east side that was white. Oh, it was the east what side? Yeah, was and the white. west was... <laughs> OK. Then that could be something slightly different. I, I was thinking, my, my first thought was that yeah. it had melted um, with the sun coming up and yeah. the sun had melted on the sun side, on the east, eastward side. Yeah. But what could have happened instead was in the evening, in the night before, on the evening before, the sun's sitting on the west, so the eastward side's going to get colder first. Yes. So when the air is getting to the point where it wants to form a frost, the water in it could, um, isn't, isn't going to condense on the westward side because the westward side's much too warm. But on the eastward side, it's cold enough for it to condense yeah. and form a frost. So I think probably what happened was that the night before, the eastward side was cold enough to form a frost, but the westward side was warm enough. Yeah. And by the time the westward side is, would be cold enough to, for the um, frost to form on it, all of the water will have condensed on something else, on the eastward side of the roof and, other, and the grass and the roads and other bits of the... Uh, everywhere else. Yeah. So there's no water left in the atmosphere to condense on them. Mm. Ian, that's a lovely question. Thank you so much. Yeah, all right. Bye, Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. That's Ian there. Uh, questions about uh, the, the hoarfrost, which was really quite something, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, there have been some really good cold nights recently. Paul Bostrat in near Stevenage says, Dr Dave, how come the utility companies' underground pipes and cables didn't break in this week's earthquake? Maybe they're all plastic now. Likewise, overhead pylons and electricity wires uh, must have enough slack built in. Also, would our buildings have been weakened at foundations? Because it was quite a big Richter scale, wasn't it? I mean, it, it was about five, it was about five on 5. the Richter 2, scale. 5.2, 5.3, 5. 5. 5. 5. Mm. depending on... I've seen various different numbers, depending mm. on... They work it out by... Um, they have little size... They have seismometers, which sure. measure how much the Earth shake. And if you look at enough of them, you can see the waves... The earth, the shaking waves passing out from around the place, how quickly they decay away, and you can work out how big the vibration mm. must have been at the centre and how much energy there is there. And that's what the how the number in the Richter scale means. 
I think it was quite a deep earthquake. It was about six miles down. Mm. So that means that nothing was very, very close to it. So by the time it reached the surface, the energy had spread out quite a lot. So there was nothing actually shaking too violently at the surface, which would be part of the reason why things like cables and pipes haven't broken. The reason why you definitely get pipes and cables um, breaking is if you get the movement in the earthquake, because the earthquake's two rocks sliding up mm. past each other. If that movement actually makes it all the way to the surface, mm. you can sometimes get two lumps, two, two pieces of rock, which used to be right next to each other, a metre apart. Um, there's some beautiful places. I went on a trip to Greece once, and you get huge um, rock faces, like a kilometre high, which have just been an earth- earthquake after earthquake after earthquake, lifting one side and dropping the other side. Gosh. And so you form a kilometre high cliff because one lump of rock's going upwards yeah. and the other one's going downwards. Um, and basically this earthquake definitely didn't reach the surface, so there was nothing actually trying to rip anything apart yeah. along the line of the earthquake. Um, and basically... They're, I mean, if you have something long and thin like a pipe, it'll be quite flexible. Sure. Even if it's made out of steel, it's re- relatively flexible. Mm. So it's just not big enough to break it, really. Mm. Um, it was strong enough to knock my... Uh, <laughs> a few, uh, I had three books fall down and two CDs off a shelf, you know, which, which all right, it, it, and that's on top, of, uh, on top of my desk, you know, just a book yeah. I put there because so I've got some um, shelf space. And I was, I was stunned <laughs> that they came off. <laughs> it's not something we th- ever think about in this no. country. A friend yeah. of mine went to live in um, Japan for a couple of years and she said she went there she put all her stuff on a, um, on shelves mm. within a couple of weeks with the earthquake everything had fallen off and in Japan no one puts things on shelves no they don't do they, they put them in boxes because if you put them on shelves there's an earthquake and it falls off and all that beautiful art that they did as well, those lovely Ming vines, you know, all, the, all, the, all that stuff. You've got to tie it down. <laughs> Crikey, yes. Let's get back onto our carbon footprint. <laughs> um, was the carbon footprint higher during the Industrial Revolution with the enormous amount of fossil fuel burning? If it was, why was it so much colder? That's from John. Although you think of the Industrial Revolution involving burning huge amounts of coal mm. and um, lots of things going on, actually, compared to what we're burning now, it's probably they were probably burning an awful lot less. Really? Because the reason why it's suddenly all of a shock, all this coal burning, is all of a sudden that people have worked out how to do it, and before, before that there was virtually none, and it increased hugely. But even now we burn a lot of coal. Um, I've just got some statistics from the States because I found that more easily. Um, I mean, in about it was 1900, sort of, peak of the Industrial Revolution, 1900, 1920 sort of times, we're now burning about twice as much coal as then. Mm. Although you wouldn't have thought it, um, it's because we're just burning it for electricity, because we just use so much more energy than we used to. We sort of use 10, 20, 30 times more energy than we did 100 years ago, because everyone's driving around the place, everyone's flying around the place. Mm. So we're emitting huge amounts more carbon, even just in the developed world than we used to. And that's not including China, which is suddenly taking off in a huge industrial revolution of its own, Mm. and all the other countries which have since then. And so basically we're burning far more fuel. Also during the 19th century, it was part of what was known as the Little Ice Age. And so just naturally the sort of 19th, 18th, 19th century was particularly cold, which was why you could have things like ice fairs on the Thames during the winter. It was just colder then. And it was, just, it was warming up towards the end of the 19th century naturally. And now we're burning all these fossil fuels. It's going to add to that and speed up that natural effect. Mm, mm, scary stuff, isn't it? Really it is. is. I mean, the world changes naturally, but if we start playing around with it, you can change it a lot more and a lot quicker than it would do naturally. Yeah. Mark says he has a question about the Bermuda Triangle. From what he knows, the last thing to go missing uh, was in the 1980s, and um, he wanted to know if anything else had gone missing since. And also, do we not hear about it? Why do we not hear about it anymore? I think it depends what kind of TV programs you watch. <laughs> on, on some channels, I'm sure it's full of stuff about the Bermuda Triangle. Um, I don't know. I don't th- think. I don't know that there's any. I think there are possibly slightly more things going missing in the Bermuda Triangle, but not hugely more than anywhere else in the world. There are other places with as many ships getting lost and as many planes getting lost. Mm. It's just at some point someone wrote a lot, of, wrote a lot of stories about it. And it became quite... And then once you've written a load of stories about it, everyone noticed when anything went missing in this area around Bermuda, Mm. which we can call the Bermuda Triangle. Um, There have been some quite interesting theories as to what might be causing this sort of thing. One of them is that uh, under the oceans, um, when 
and vegetation rots, it can yes. give off methane in the same yeah. way as vegetation digesting in yes. cattle stomachs can give off methane. Yes. If it's rotting, and if it, so if you get a load of vegetation down on the bottom of the ocean, it gets covered up with, um, if it gets really deep and covered up with um, sort of sediment, yeah. um, then it can rot away gently under there and produce methane. And under, and under enough pressure, this methane kind of gets locked away in ice. And so you get these great big build-ups of, of methane trapped in ice under the bottom of the ocean. If you get a little earthquake or a little land, underwater landslip, then this methane can get released. And so you get all these huge bubbles of methane coming up. And if, you're, if you have a ship sitting in a load of bubbles, yes. um, it, doesn't, it won't float as well as it was sitting in water because sure. the bubbles make the water less dense and so the ship might sink. Um, the very, especially if you had a really big ship, if you just had a load of bubbles in the middle of the ship, it could break the ship in two because the middle would sink and the mm. ends would stay floating and it would sink in two. And also if you were in a plane, then all of a sudden you actually get less lift because methane is not as dense as air right. and your engine would stop working because there isn't enough oxygen. And so your plane would stop working, so maybe that could be the reason why planes would crash. Um, it would also produce all sorts of strange meteorological yeah. effects, which it would definitely be very interesting to be in one. Yeah, because it is during that area, then there have been a lot of things that have gone missing in that area. Yeah. So it's, I mean, uh, they, they doesn't just, these, these uh, um, methane emissions don't just happen in, um, around the Media Triangle, they happen in other places. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's other theories. Yeah. But there's not a huge, it's not a huge effect there yeah. to explain. Yeah. But. I haven't heard of anything. I, know. I, I have to make an apology here because um, I said about Ming vases are from China and not Japan and the earthquakes happening in Japan. I do apologise. I was just thinking of all the great art that came out of there. So um, sorry if I got my geography wrong. I was very keen on it at that time, but it was a kind of thought that sprung into my head as often they do. Another text that's coming here, can a jetliner fly on half of its available engines? Definitely. all. Pl- I think pretty much all multi-engine jet airliners can fly if they lose one engine, certainly. I I think um, if you've got a four-engine plane, if you lose if you lose two engines on different sides, then that's pretty much okay. I think that they struggle and they'll slow down a bit and they'll take you longer. Um, I know for certain that the Boeing 777, which is a fairly recent plane with only two engines, which travels across the Atlantic, um, they had to be very, very careful that it could fly absolutely fine with no problems at all on one engine um, without sort of pushing it and without having to rev the engine too high. So it could travel the whole Atlantic on one engine without breaking a sweat, basically, in, because just for the safety's sake, if you're in the mid-Atlantic, you can't find a, somewhere to land quickly. Mm. I think normal planes, and the smaller planes, I think something like a 737, can fly on one engine. It's just kind of a bit hard work for it, and it wouldn't want to do it for too long, so that it lands fairly quickly. Yeah. But yes, all, all planes can survive losing one engine. I think even the four-engine ones can survive losing two but it's more difficult if they're both on one side because then the plane is trying to f- turn a corner because all the engines are on one side. And so it will tend to try and pull it around a corner. Right, so let's put that to him, uh, that mind at rest. Thank you very much for your text. Uh, one here about from uh, Simon. He says, um, hi, Sue and science people, Dr. Dave. Um, why does deja vu exist and what does it mean? Um, I'm not an expert on this. I can only really talk from my own experiences. Um, My biggest um, experience of deja vu was after I had a bicycle accident about five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. Came off my bike, I was being stupid, not wearing a bicycle helmet and bashed my head quite hard. Um, got quite a bad concussion. Um, I had all sorts of various strange um, effects, including some strange visual effects, whereby um, I find it very, found it very difficult dealing with uh, objects moving in, in my peripheral vision um, for a couple, for a few weeks. But one thing I got was I used to find quite a lot that I'd walk into a room and meet someone, and then sort of 15 minutes later I'd have this really deep uh, idea that I'd met them ages ago. I'm not sure whether this is because I'm in Cambridge and lots of pe- and you bump mm. into lots of people lots of times. But I think it was much stronger than I would do normally. Mm. And I, I think um, when I had my bicycle accident, I had some strange effects whereby I couldn't remember anything for more than about 15 minutes. Mm. So for a period of sort of three or four hours, I would just forget everything every 15 minutes. Mm. Apparently, um, um, I met one of the nurses again later because she was going out with a flatmate of mine. And she said that every 15 minutes I'd t- say to her, yeah, well, it's really interesting. Every 15 minutes I forget something. <laughs> and 15 minutes later I'd say, you know what? It's really interesting. Every 15 minutes I'm forgetting it. But that's interesting as well that you could remember that every 15 minutes yeah. that you could, that, that, yeah. that was there. I, mean, I think I was kind of sort of studying myself as I have a tendency to do in these situations. Do you? Hmm. And obviously I was very interested by this and I kept telling her how interesting it was. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, one last very quick one here. Um, John says, what are the chances of a really severe earthquake happening here in the UK? Does it all depend on the faults in the earth? Um, he thought that the UK was quite safe. I mean, the UK is one of the safest places for earthquakes. Um, I think the biggest earthquake on record was about a, um, six, which occurred in the middle of the English Channel, uh, six on the Richter scale, and that was about sort of 150 years ago. I think you're very, very, very unlikely to get the really, really big, destru- really destructive earthquakes, sort of factor sevens and eights in the UK, mm. just because there's, although there's this um, ice age effect, it's not, and nothing's happening very quickly, so it's, you're not building up the stresses quick enough to build a very, very, very big, powerful earthquake. Those are generally associated with um, the edges of, earth, of te- tectonic plates, especially where you get two tectonic plates smashing into each other, because then um, the friction, you've not just got the friction of two rocks just sitting next to each other, you've got mm. the friction of these huge tectonic plates pushing on each other so the rocks stick together much longer and much harder so you can build up much bigger forces before the fault jumps and so places like under down under um, the andes in south america you get very strong earthquakes um, and iran as well you get mm. two plates crashing into each other they get incredibly powerful earthquakes that's it for this week Our doctors will be back with me next week for more Ask the Naked Scientist. But don't forget you can also catch them on the Naked Scientist podcast, which you can find on the Naked Scientist website, www.nakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientists are sponsored by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com.